Okay, so similarly with what we did with uh, feet last week, <clears throat> we'll deal with hands in two parts, or right? simple versions, you know, that give us something to kind of build off of inside, say, 30 seconds, two minutes, that essentially just kind of act as placeholders, but also um, give us something a little bit more structurally accurate. Uh, to deal with. What's with all the hands? Oh, there was those from earlier in class when I was asking questions. I'm guessing earlier in class. We talked uh, to show our attendance. Uh, oh, that's nice. We raised our hands, yeah. Thanks, everyone. Attendance. I find attendance a funny thing. I mean, I get it. <clears throat> but I mean, you guys are paying to be here. <laughs> Why wouldn't you be in class? It doesn't make any sense to me whatsoever. Okay. Um, <clears throat> again, with the arms, right, more so than with the legs, less is more. And that includes, right, moving into the hands itself. And it's useful to think about the hand as being an extension of the forearm, even more so than the foot being an extension of the leg. Because if you look at, say, the arm from the front or the back, I was trying to get this straight <clears throat> here. And let's say that the arm is turned palm out. And so we'll look at that from the front and we'll look at that from and the back, from the front and the back. Now, first off and most importantly is like that, your hand, right, when you put it in relationship to this is only gonna look as good as whatever your forearm is doing. And so you can't really distinguish one from the other unless you're just drawing an isolated hand. And what I would, even though we're dealing with, and I've mentioned this a number of times, this more tapering shape, either two-dimensional or three-dimensional for the lower arm, it's useful to think about that lower arm as being from say this point forward, the halfway point from the elbow to the wrist forward as essentially just being <clears throat> a rectangular block. If we're looking at that from the front or the back, it's different from profile and other positions of the, uh, of the hand. But if we're looking at something like this or like this, that's a really useful right, um, shape to deal with, right? So, this point here, right, that for all intents and purposes is flat, even though it's narrowing right, as it comes down from the elbow. So one way, another way of thinking about that shape might be something like this, right? We have a cylinder three-dimensionally attached to right, a bit of a, a cone, right? So it's more of like a funnel type of shape right, as opposed to, um, what you might call it, a, a cone. Okay. So as we've gone over already, this basically takes care of right that bulge of the extensor that wraps over top of the elbow. And so we still want that tapering aspect of the lower arm. We just don't want it to get too narrow at the wrist, right? One of the common structural area errors of the lower arm is by narrowing the wrist too much because we tend to think about that wrist as being quite narrow especially from certain positions because the wrist does look narrower from that position than it does from that position but right because of the nature of the arm and how it twists as well right we get a wide variety of different thicknesses and thinnesses to it but we also get certain landmarks say like the bulge of this bone right the bulge of your ulna that exaggerates right, the dip in between the outside muscle of the arm right the outside or the outside muscle or the muscle on the outside of the hand the muscles and the bones on the outside of the arm right so that when we get into right, certain positions it's going to appear much narrower than other positions so there's going to be a natural tendency to want to narrow that area and this is a nice way of making sure that that doesn't happen it's also a nice way of setting proportion because if then I then think about my hand as basically just being the same length as that initial block, that does two things. One, it sets the proportion of the hand from wrist out to the end of the finger, out to the end of the fingers. It also recognizes that 
once you come off of the outside or the inside of the forearm into the sides of the hand and the sides of the finger, there's almost no change in volume as you come out towards the proximal ends of, or the distal ends of the finger. And then this overall shape is essentially just divided in half to separate palm stuff from finger stuff. And that's gonna be exactly the same whether or not you're dealing with things from the back or from the front. Okay, so that's just an easy way of remembering all of that stuff. Now, when we add to this stuff, first and foremost, what's important, right, is looking at finger stuff, which has now been taken care of in terms of a group, right, and then thumb stuff, which is just another group, although it's a triangular shape kind of stuffed onto right, that square shape. So basically what I'm doing is I'm reducing this into a square, this into a square, and then looking at that chunk of space there as being an extension off of that square. And same thing on the outside of the hand, I'm softening this shape by putting in a curve on the outside to represent this muscle here on the outside of the hand. Okay, so all that's doing is simplifying the fingers down into a proportion and into a group. And this is a nice way of thinking about the hand in general that is probably counterintuitive because of the um, <clears throat> dexterous nature of the fingers, right? And how manipulable they are. We tend to think about the fingers as being individual things as opposed to right, a block of fingers. Right? The more that you can group the fingers, right, the easier the fingers are going to be to set proportionally, but then also break down into individual details. Okay, so that initial shape looks exactly the same, both from the front to the back, right? and I'm just going to blow this up now so that we can deal with it a little bit more legibly. And so that initial structure there is exactly the same from both the front and the back. And it looks clunky of a purpose. Right, so this isn't something, again, that you want to detail. This is more something that you're going to build on top of <clears throat> by adding what's necessary as opposed to taking away. So what I mean by that is that your wrist right, is essentially going to come straight into that, and it's going to be the bulge of the thumb and the bulge of the pinky muscle, both from the front and the back, right, that make the wrist feel narrower as opposed to literally moving the wrist in like this which tends to you know, do fucking weird things like this, right? where you have a hand sitting at the end right, of an, a wrist that's way too narrow and a forearm that's way too bulgy. Now, <clears throat> let's say that this is the palm side right, and this is the back side of the hand. So I've mentioned you've got a couple of muscles. You've got a big muscle here right, on the pinky side of things, right, and then you have another big muscle here on the thumb side of things. Right? What you also have up towards the top of the hand is a collection of fat pads and calluses that create essentially an indentation in the center of the hand that's roughly triangular. And so this as a graphic shape can be really useful just to kind of reference the fact that there's those two muscles there. They're also really useful ways of now developing volume inside that area. So that's one way that we can start to soften the hand. Another thing to recognize is that from the underside of the hand, these muscles have to overlap the bones of the wrist. So that graphic overlap is an important one to recognize from both sides. And then on the underside of the hand, you'll also have these two tendons that are a nice detail to kind of put in here. So just by doing this, that starts to soften things and helps to separate hand from wrist stuff. These two tendons are called flexor tendons, right? One of those really visible ones does this, right? And you can see them engage, right? As I start to move the wrist forward. And so one bends the entire hand. The other one is responsible for bending all the little fingers, right? And you can see the one that's further over to the right, right? On your screen, right? Engaging and that happens. Okay, so those are nice little details to put in, right? As well as, you know, just little creases underneath that, right? especially when you get into a bent position of the arm as a way of conveying a sense of compression. On the back of the hand, you don't have any of those details, not ones that are useful anyway. You do have tendons though, 
right? That and you can see these are your extensor tendons. Those extensor tendons, they are useful to remember right, a couple of different things, but not necessarily to draw them. They have a central start point. And so this tendon from the flexor side, right? It basically extends out and then fans out to all of the individual fingers. So when you're in a position like this with the hand, this becomes a useful point to, in order to position the fingers. Likewise, you have a common tendon or a common muscle that controls the extension of all of those fingers from the dorsal side. And it does the exact same thing, right? So that's not gonna be particularly useful here, right? But it will be useful when we get into a position of the hand like this, where you're grouping the fingers, even though they're all separate from each other in a position like this, because from both the flexor and the extensor side. Now, these things run right down the middle of, or sorry, this runs right down the middle of the hand, and that lines up directly with your middle finger, right? As a result, you know, maybe it's being called your middle finger as a result of that. So when I pull this up like that, I can now extend my fingers out through, or from that central point through the middle fingers, the ends, right? And then feed in the gap right, with your ring finger as a way of positioning the fan inside that overall block. So that overall block is useful just to kind of position the overall shape of those things and pattern of those things. And then the tendons on the back, especially, and even from the bottom are useful for setting the pattern inside that block, but you don't want to draw them, right? Because if you draw them, sorry, I shouldn't say you don't want to draw them. You don't want to darken them because if you darken them, they're just going to look like train tracks on the back of your hand, right? It's just going to look weird, right? So it's more of like a way of identifying how this pattern happens, not particularly useful in this position of the hand. Because this proportion only sets your middle finger. The rest of your fingers have, right, have different lengths associated with them that takes on a bit more of a mitt-like appearance. Now, when I spread my fingers like this, you can see that the fingers have a natural arc that kind of exaggerates right, and simplifies that um, relationship with the different lengths of the fingers. That arc is also echoed along the top of the knuckles, right? So your knuckles aren't flat, they have an arc apexing at your middle knuckle. And that's the exact same from the back of the hand. So we can soften this overall square shape again, in addition to doing this and this and this, right, as a way of capturing that structural aspect. And then we can mimic that arc by changing that hand into kind of like more of a mitten once the proportion's been set to soften that overall experience. Now, in terms of the overall, right, and then the individual knuckles, your individual knuckles also mirror that, mirror that arc. And, so, and that's gonna be exactly the same from the underside right, as, as well. And certain patterns, right, of relationships, the top, top of the index finger and top of the ring finger, they're almost identical to each other, ring finger being a little bit longer, right? and then your pinky finger basically being in line with the first knuckle for the third knuckle, whatever, this knuckle of your index and your ring finger, right? So that gives you a good indicator of where the pinky finger, right, has to be in terms of its overall length. Now your fingers do narrow a little bit when they're in this position, right? So that's another way of softening this is by narrowing those shapes in like that, if the hand happens to be in this position, which, you know, generally speaking, it isn't, it's in a much more complicated position, but that's a nice detail to recognize, right? So these things do move in a little bit. Now, what's important about also to recognize about the hand is that the hand only really moves in this direction, right? So I can bend that to about a 45 degree in that direction. So if I'm looking at the hand from this side and I wanna bend it outwards towards right, the pinky side, right? that works or that happens relatively easily. I cannot do the same thing in the other direction. I can move it in a little bit, but not very much. This is because of the nature of this bone here, the radius, it always sits lower than that bone, your ulna, okay? So that becomes a useful landmark to look for as well. It's like always looking for where this bulge is. Okay? And that bulge on the dorsal side sits right about there, which means that this has to go underneath that, right, in terms of a detail, but also importantly, 
that little bulge there is an addition to that initial shape. And that's what creates this apparent dip. Likewise, on the outside of the thumb, or outside of the hand and thumb side of the thumb, right? You'll thumb side of the hand, right? You'll see that you've got these two tendons here. These are the tendons that control the flex or the extension of the thumb. One controls the entire thumb. The other one controls just the extension of the thumb itself. So by the entire thumb, I mean all of this here is like one is doing this. That's this guy here. The other one, and you can see it engage, is doing this. What's important about those, right, is that they come over top of this bone here. So those go on top of your wrist. All that you don't really necessarily want to draw that like that, although this little triangular bit here called your anatomical snuff box, this is where people used to, right? Before we had <laughs> before we had other means of doing it. Right? Those things go on top of this. And then that forces this muscle underneath both of those. Right? And then you can soften this overall shape by putting that volume in there as well. Okay, so that gives you a nice graphic overlap as well right? in terms of the way that those things need to be functioning. Everything else about this is about fingers. Right? And all your fingers are essentially structured the same. Every finger, it has bones that look like this. And all bones kind of look like this, right? where there's a head section and a shaft section to it. Right? And your fingers bulge at those head sections and narrow at the shaft sections, which means that you get a volume. And it does the exact same thing when you get into your hand bones itself. Your hand bones, by the way, these are, these are called uh, metacarpals. Your wrist bones are carpals. Your fingers are called phalange. Right? So if I use any of those terms, what the, that's what those mean. So the junction points of all of these bones, they create volumes. Right? This is another way of saying that these flare, right? or at least they have more volume, the same way that your elbows and your shoulders have more volume. They don't truncate, even though, again, they appear to get narrower in certain positions. Right? They're actually bulging. What's also important about these is if we simplify this, is that each individual finger or joint of the finger gets shorter and narrower as it comes out towards its distal end. Distal being this or the side that's farthest away from you, proximate being the area that's closest to you, which means that the overall shape of the finger is more triangular. Right? than it is <coughs> sausagey. Right? We want to stay away from this guy. I mean, this generally happens with our hands. Right? We get, as your hands and joints in general just get older and shittier, right? and we get you know, a lifetime of abuse that basically um, takes away this narrowing capacity right? and dilutes the bulging capacity at the individual, at the individual joints. Can you pet him so he shuts up? <laughs> so we want to use something like this, right? Because the shape that's going to be going over top of that looks something more like that. This is one it's our cat. He's an asshole. He just, he just makes the most annoying sounds for no apparent fucking reason whatsoever. So when we start to populate this space, right, this is the type of shape that we're using. But when we start to populate this space, again, we're basing that on groups. So if you have a position of the hand like this, that's what your hand looks like to begin with. It's not individual fingers, right? It's essentially just a group of stuff that has this triangular wedge of stuff off the side of it. And the tip of your thumb, right, lines up about where the first knuckle is going to be. And then this knuckle of the thumb lines up where those things are going to be, right? So that's a nice way of starting to associate those two chunks. Now, as soon as you get into this, now we're looking at just this overall shape here for these last two digits of the thumb to simplify that area. So you're not drawing something like this. You're not drawing like, you know, Edward Scissorhands, right? Where you got is something that's roughly triangular that captures the tapering nature of a finger. 
But inside here, I've already mentioned that this is more easily identified as a block of space. Then when you start to break that up, this pattern helps to break that space up right into all of these individual fingers that have that specific shape, but have to be following that pattern. Right, so that goes, and then if we drop this overall volume down from the side of that initial square shape, when we put these two volumes in, that's what gives the, um, the, sensation, the sensation of a dip at that junction at that junction point. Okay, so this can be easily be dealt with as a group, right? That can easily be dealt with as a group, where right? we get a hand position that looks you know, something like that. That's a potential hand. Another potential hand is say something like this, where I'm grouping that into a position like this, right? Or a position like that, or a position like this. The inside finger though, when you're separating it, it moves a lot less than your outside finger. Right? So just like I can't really move my wrist in like this too much, I can't really move my inside finger in too much. This and this almost always kind of line straight up with each other, right? And that almost always comes straight off the inside of the wrist as well. Whereas the outside, right? That you can get basically 90 degrees worth of a change of direction at full spread from your thumb all the way out to your pinky. So that's a nice, that's a nice thing to know so that, uh, you know, you're not making weird structural changes right here, right? This has very little movement. This has a potentially a lot of movement. Okay, so this only takes care of the front and the back for our purposes. Um, <clears throat> so it's a good point here to screenshot this you know, right before we move into the profile of the hand, because the profile of the hand is slightly different. Again, with the profile of the hand, right, think about it with respect to the forearm and that forearm from about the halfway point down to the wrist. And in a really simplified version of this, taking the top of the forearm straight out into basically what looks like a rough triangle. Right? What we're doing here is essentially taking advantage of this shape there. Right? And the hand, you'll notice, is like doesn't really come straight off of there. Like that's actually quite unnatural. The resting position of the hand is probably going to be more something like this, where you're having a change of direction into the back of the hand. Right? Over top of your wrist. Right? And your wrist actually has Right, a little triangular wedge shape as it starts to move down like that. These are where your carpals are or your wrist bones are. Now that shape, both from the inside and the outside, even though the inside and the outside are very different, we can start off by using this as a placeholder, say inside your two minutes or your 30 seconds. Right? This is obviously not going to be applicable in say other positions of the hand, like a fist, where your fist is more easily represented by that or by that, depending on the position and how it is that you want to represent that. Because now, right, I'm just adding chunks of information to that right, as a way of making that basic shape turn into a fist. Likewise, I'm just adding stuff or taking away stuff from this. So let's call this the pinky side and this the thumb side. With the thumb side, what I'm adding is that chunk of space there. And then thinking about this as having a halfway point, this proportion being roughly equal to that proportion there. This obviously looks clunky and shitty. Likewise with this, rather than adding, I'm taking away stuff from here and carving this shape in to that space as a way of identifying this muscle there. So here I'm identifying all of this stuff. There I'm identifying this stuff 
And then the leftover bit of that piece of pizza or whatever it is you want to call it basically identifies what the rest of the hand is doing. Now, again, this looks shitty. I am under no illusions that it looks that it looks good. But the idea here is that we're now adding a little bit of something here, right, as a way of taking into account, right, these tendons overlapping that area. Right, adding in a little bit here and softening right, as a way of making that feel a little less clunky. We'll go over this more in the second half of the class where we're now adding in right, an idea of the individual joints so that I can start to change the nature of that shape into something that looks a little bit less shitty. Here, I'm doing much the same thing. And then softening this so that that starts to appear a little bit more thumbish. So it goes from something pretty clunky to something that's you know relatively decent, pretty fast. The bone of your radius needs to go underneath that stuff, right? But then the flexors and the tendons then go behind this stuff, right? And then this has a bit of a bulge because of the muscle on the inside or on the thumb side of that. All that's left over here now is right, what are the other fingers doing? What the other fingers are doing is better represented by what the tops of those fingers are doing. Because as you bend your fingers, the individual bones obviously don't change shape, right? nor does the angle at the top of the finger. The angle at the top of the finger right, stays consistent. The underside of the finger, though, changes position or changes shape pretty significantly as the fat pads and calluses underneath there bulge up and compress against each other. So basically what that means is that you want to look for what the tops of the fingers are doing with respect to these other what are called lead groups. Lead groups just being the lead fingers, the, the fingers that are closest to you. Because now that I have those there, you know, I can get a rough idea of where the underside of the fingers are, even right, a little chunk of the bottom of the palm of the hand, right, if I can physically see that. Right. And because this has to be attached to that, I can kind of work out in reverse right, what those other fingers are doing. And keeping in mind that you know, these things are overlapping from one side, from this side to the other. And it's the exact same thing on the other side. Right? This doesn't work so well in terms of demonstration, right? but I'm looking for what this finger is doing. right? And then what this finger is doing, and then what the other fingers are doing with respect to it. All right, so that's just an easy way of getting across that information without having to do too much legwork with this initial shape. And again, remembering that that bulge here is poking up, is poking up there. This muscle is coming up like this and has this overall shape as it moves down towards the underside of the palm, individual knuckles, that initial shape, this overlaps that, that also overlaps this. And then what are the other fingers doing with respect to that lead group? overlapping as is necessary. Keeping in mind that all of this stuff has to be attached to there, right? So if they don't feel like they're going to that spot, it's gonna look weird. Okay, now obviously there's lots to expand upon this, right? Which is what we're gonna do in the second half of class, right? But this at least gives us a way of starting to interpret certain things. So a really common and really irritating position of the hand, for example, is Say that Ezra is like leaning on his hand as it's a support mechanism, and that hand is coming at you and foreshortening something like this. Well, an easy way of thinking about that is to come down, block in this space, block in this space, right, and now put in a little wedge of thumb so that I can deal with that hand as a simplified shape. Even though, do you know, there's a fair amount of interpretation with what that hand is doing perspectively, right? And what those structures need to look like. Okay. 
because now in here, at least I've got a way of saying, all right, well, that's that where that finger is. Let's say that these, well, let's just say that these two fingers are grouped together. That makes that a little bit easier. And that these two fingers are grouped together. That makes that a little bit easier. And then the thumb is just, you know, that one kid off doing his own thing. This bulge happens or has to sit there. These muscles have to go in and behind it. I know that there's gonna be compression right, of stuff sitting there. So that starts to turn into something a little bit you know, more convincing. And, and more importantly, it starts to turn into something that is a little bit easier to draw. Right? Because the hand is so articulate, right, it's very easy to get confused with you know, the individual positions and details of the hand. But if you can make the move right, to thinking about it in you know, simpler forms, those simpler forms right, make it significantly easier to start to turn it into something that's a little bit more understandable. If we focus it on in terms of details, it's a hopeless task. Right? So these basic shapes go a long way, I mean, even though there's a fair amount of interpretation right, in the sense that this doesn't really look much you know, like that, right? even though those details are much the same. Okay, so let's go ahead and take a screenshot of that. <coughs> and Ezra, let's uh, do a pose <laughs> that has, say, that, that classic version of yours, uh, your arms hanging out. Yeah, exactly. Let's do that one. <laughs> Okay, now, again, this makes no impact on your 30 second or two minute section really, other than the fact that it might change the nature of what you use as a placeholder for the hands. But what we're again trying to do in your gesture is simplify things as much as possible. So those arms become just this overall box. Right? Cannot stress the value of this more or more great right? because that overall box next makes it easy to locate where that elbow is going to be locating where that elbow is going to be makes it easy to identify where that arm or where that hand is going to be and now as a result where the shape of the back of that hand now has to be likewise right? this box now identifies where the other elbow is going to be and because that elbow and this arm have to have a very particular relationship to each other oh, on, on. It's not going to make any sense. Now I have to have a very particular relationship with each other. I now know that the wrist now has to be out over here with respect to that. And any foreshortening that I've done or that I'm experiencing with this arm and that forearm is now literally trapped by that initial shape. And now simplifying this overall shape into you know something that is roughly kind of like lobster-like grouping all of these fingers together into an overall mitten that's attached to this other basic shape and then using that as a way of identifying where the thumb is going to be and then likewise over here where is this thumb going to be right. leaving the complexity of those fingers alone right for the moment so all this does is helps to set up that information right and hopefully underscores the importance of using those simple shapes so when I come in to dealing with this arm, I now know that I'm just adding this chunk of space here in order to make this feel a little bit more tapering. I know that there has to be this volume here. This is gonna be important to the structure of the elbow or for the lower arm moving forward, right? Because this bone has to be attached to the bulge of your elbow. Underneath here, now I've got a bulge of the outside of the hand. I've got a flattening at the top of the wrists as it comes off the flattening of the top of the forearm and into the flatness of the top of the back of the hand. Starting with this finger here inside this overall group, I can now soften this overall space by breaking it up into individual chunks of space where, where I've got this chunk of space here that now makes it easier to identify where that chunk of space is which now makes it easier to identify where that chunk of space is. 
then there's a distinct change in direction, right? As I come over right, into the last two phalange of the finger, which now makes it easier to draw the next finger, which now makes it easier to draw the bit of the finger that's extending beyond that. Right? And then likewise, right, drawing this little chunk of the underside of the thumb section of the hand in there. Right? So that starts to become now just a little bit nicer to draw all right, and nicer to look at. For dealing with this thing graphically, right? now I'm coming up right in this direction, right? And now having this detail here right, is caused by the bulge right, of that volume coming into that section, right? So that's your knuckle pushing up against the surface of the skin that's now creating that. The volume of the knuckle here also controls the detail of that arc as it starts to move up and over top of the knuckle. And so that's a little bit more apparent there, but that gives me a way of identifying those vo or those volumes or the sort of those details with respect to those volumes. Now we'll do more of this in the second half of class, but that's the same thing that's happening here and happening here. Likewise, as I come over here, you can see there's like there's a pattern that's emerging right, with the knuckles at the end of that simplified block of the hand. And then if I identify where my middle finger is and that middle finger basically just moving straight forward, once I know where the end of the middle finger is, then the end of the index finger is easier to find. The end of the ring finger as it angles in is a little bit easier to find. And then the angle of the pinky finger as it moves in is a little bit easier to find. All of that stuff is essentially in shadow and we haven't dealt with shadow, but even if we weren't, right, there's other ways of identifying changes of planes, right? So <clears throat> one way of identifying that there right, is just by putting in right, these decreasing chunks of space with respect to this overall chunk of space there. Now you notice that I'm not outlining the fingers. There's no real need to outline the fingers, right? especially when they're that close together. Lines have a weird way of implying space. So because this over here has more of a space in, be or in between the index and the middle finger, when I include, right, say, a line on the inside of that middle finger, ugh, as I fucked up your finger, What that means now is that it starts to feel like space, like in a significant amount of space, just because of the width of that line. And likewise on the inside of this finger. Whereas if I don't do that here, now it makes it feel like those things are more tightly compressed against each other. Right? And I would recommend right, that if that's the case, right, to err on the side of not putting those lines in. Because what I can do right, is imply that those lines exist or those silhouette edges exist just by darkening the end of the line as those fingers overlap each other and darkening the end of the line as it comes up against the webbing of the finger. Now we'll get into the individual details of the hand in the second half of the second half of the class, but hopefully what I would like there to be a takeaway from here is that there's an interpretation that's going on here, but an interpretation that's built on really simple to use stuff. Right? That will make your life significantly less frustrating right? as you start to approach, you know, what is, you know, one of the more difficult areas of the pose to deal with or the body to deal with. Right, so that you've got something that's relatively convincing as a hand. Now, also, thank you, Ezra, that's great. Okay, also, that's the size of my hand, right? So my drawing, right, of each individual hand is about right, the full length of my thumb. 
right? So what that means is that if you're doing a drawing that's this big, right, and you're expecting to draw hands inside that drawing where now the entire torso is the size of one knuckle of my thumb, this is never going to work. Right? Because now you've got too small of a space to cram too much detail inside of. And now you're struggling not only against the information, but you're also struggling against the physical dexterity necessary in order to put in that amount of detail inside a small space. So this is a way of saying, draw bigger. Okay? Especially if you're drawing on small pieces of paper, you should be drawing the whole pose at least full size on that piece of paper. Right? So that's a full size piece of newsprint there. And just that section of the body, right, takes up at least half of that page or about half of that page, and the hands are correspondingly large. So if you draw, if you draw bigger as well, it'll take a bit of getting used to for a lot of you. Um, I was a small drawer, so I can appreciate. This will make your life a lot easier. It seems like a small thing to consider, but it's significant in terms of uh, just making your job, your job easier. Okay, um, like I said, there's lots more information to go over with the hands. We'll go over that in the second half of the class. But for right now, let's uh, fire your feeds and your shares up again and start going into five minute poses. Gesture and structure the same way that you have been. But when we start getting into more specific structure, let's focus on the arms and the hands first. Easy arm, easy hand first. More difficult arm, more difficult. So AKA less familiar, foreshortened, irritating, complex position. Okay on or as the second arm hand that you draw, All right? And Ezra will uh, control his poses so that there is an easy hand in each one of them in order for you to get the practice in. Okay, guys, let's do this. Now, it's important to keep in mind that, you know, when we're doing this more developed stuff, right, and this, especially in the second half of the class with the feet and with the hands. This isn't like the only time that we're ever going to uh, address this. Like, so it's not like I'm going to say this once and, you know, this is like, I'll never mention how to develop or apply hands again. Very much like what we're going to do with the head and spend two complete classes on that, you know, that'll be very similar to eventually what will end up being the amount of time that we spend on the hands and the feet, as well as each individual limb by the time that we're all done for right now it's useful because we're doing it during maybe just to kind of like get it out of the way it'll be a little bit helpful at the beginning and then probably a lot more helpful later on as you kind of reintroduce it now <clears throat> one thing that is somewhat irritating about this initial block that we're using for the main bulk of the hand right? in addition to it having a curve right at the knuckle section that thing if we think about it three-dimensionally also has a bit of an arc as it comes across the knuckles, right? So the palm of the hand right, actually has a bit of a concavity to it or convexity, I suppose, depending on which way you're looking at it. And that apex of that convexity is or concavity is at the middle knuckle. And the middle or the other knuckles, right, the other fingers right, are useful to kind of like think of as having start points like this because what that allows us to do is essentially treat each individual finger again as a simplified geometric shape that gradually tapers not unlike the really simple dimensional or graphic shape that i was mentioning in the first half of class multiple ways of thinking about the finger but probably the most useful are either as a cylinder or as a long thin rectangle because all of your fingers basically have sides to it they have a top bottom right and right, um, and the individual sides and inside this overall shape right, we have the knuckle that connects us uh, the finger with the hand and then the individual knuckles of the finger but then also the tip of the finger as well right? so all of those things right, can not only turn that into a dimensional shape but then also provide the peaks and valleys of the finger, as well as providing a sense of the contour of the top of the finger, if I want to introduce, say, something like a nail bit on top of that. And so the curvature of the top of a finger or the top of that basic shape can help to identify what the tip of the finger looks like. 
you know, simply by putting that shape in. Likewise, if we put in all of these individual knuckles inside of this space, what that helps to identify, right? Just like this allows me to put in that contour and then move back into this contour that identify the top of the nail. By overlapping the nail bed itself with this, right? That gives me right, a sense of depth to that area. This it will then tell me where the volume of the finger now has to come up into the top of another contour. And we can put the wrinkles of the fingers, wrinkles of the fingers in as convenient details as a way of identifying what that contour is. Then as I come over top of this, right down the other side of that, volume, I'm going to hit another shaft section of the finger. And as a way of, again, accentuating that sense of depth, right, as well as this volume, and I'll put in another overlap that has the peak of that knuckle going in front of right, the flat line of that shaft, right? And you essentially now just rinse and repeat that with each individual knuckle. Now, when you come up to this section of the finger, right, the creases in the creases in in between the fingers pull in a particular way. So, going up, going up the knuckle like that, and it also helps to reinforce the direction that the fingers tend to pull in terms of this crease that pulls out towards the pinky side. Right? So that's a nice detail to recognize as well, as opposed to pushing it in the other way that's going to collapse um, that overall volume. Okay, so this is a really useful shape to use for pulling in that contour. This is a really useful shape to, or to use just in terms of thinking about there being a plane on this side of the finger and a plane on the other side of the finger. And so that as you come to this side of the finger, right, I'm now thinking about that as something entirely different. And because just like this provides a volume for the knuckle coming underneath, it also kind of provides a volume for the finger going underneath that, that and then moving into the fat pad and the or the fat pad and the calluses underneath that that overlap in the same direction. But this should feel like it's a completely different side than the top of or than the top of the finger. Part of that can be got across just by identifying where the nail bed is right, and by not taking these too far out, but ghosting this in underneath right, helps as well. But it's particularly useful when you get into a position where the finger is bent. Because if the finger is bent and it's coming forward like this, the knuckles have a peculiar characteristic to them. The top of the finger, as I mentioned in the first half of class, is always gonna be completely visible right? and we can basically just capture its direction. As soon as that changes direction, the angle of that, that next joint obviously changes direction on both sides. But what also stay, or but what stays similar is that the angle of this knuckle, the angle of this knuckle, and the angle of that knuckle will all be parallel to each other, as opposed to changing angle and as a result changing the structure of that area. So if that changes again down into the tip of the finger, this angle changes. But now the tip of the finger stays parallel to all of that stuff. What changes is the angle of relationship of the, un or the side of the finger at the joints as these things smoosh up against each other. So then if we also think about this as having a volume inside of here now, similar to this, you can now kind of mix and match those things. Right. And then the top of each individual knuckle will have kind of like more of a feeling like this. 
but what you can do is essentially use this volume right as a way of implying that this is this isn't a a sharp surface right or a flat surface but follow but that curve follows that same general direction and by putting that curve in is kind of mimicking this detail as well and you can put that in on the other side too right this also serves as a really useful landmark in terms of where say like a shadow reference might come in when we start dealing with shadow references now this doesn't change necessarily how you group fingers right this is more just how you deal with like the individual nature of fingers itself but, but does become you should say if i've got a finger in this position and say that the angle of my knuckle is something like that and these are just running at 90 degree or no they're not running at 90 degrees to each other I forget that i said that Okay, so let's say that that finger is doing that. If these other fingers right, are just kind of grouped together, well, then the job is to group them first. And then, use this as a way of comparing back to these other ones. And once you have, say, those individual fingers broken up, these knuckles, right, as they disappear in behind, right, will you know, be mirrored by the other knuckles that are there. And then these volumes help to identify how that stuff's going to change there. Okay, so the more that you can group, the easier this stuff becomes, right? And then just a little awareness of how that individual finger looks, right, is useful. Now, there's also patterns that will arise in the hand you can see it's like how these fingers here they're gradually moving like this as i go from one end to the other end so if i'm putting in a representation of the fist for example the only finger that moves straight up and down is your middle finger the exterior fingers of the pinky and ring finger they move in like that slightly and your index finger moves in as well, as they all, as your fingers all pull towards the middle of the hand, right? And that fist rate right, would be similar there. You can see how these angle in slightly towards that finger there. So just as they fan out from a central point, they also pull in to a central point. And then just layering the thumb over top of or underneath, however it is. You make a fist when you're doing something like this like say that you know whoever we're drawing is holding a pole you notice like how the upper finger or sorry the index finger pokes out a little bit right so this is a pretty common position of the finger where you know, say that ezra's holding a pole right? and we're looking at just the pinky side that's not very intelligible the pinky is going to wrap it around itself like this. And so the pinky literally just is a box you know, up against the edge of the hand. Right? And then all of the other fingers gradually start to do this. But the index finger does it more so. So because the pinky is the smallest of them, the other fingers end up being visible behind that. And then the index finger even more so behind that. So that's another nice pattern to look for. That box becomes really useful because then you can use that as a way of placing that exterior muscle, but then also the little bit of the thumb wedge that you can see from that side. So that doesn't really easy. It's not particularly easy for me to do. Or easy at all, or even possible. But you can kind of see is like how that muscle, right, and that box, right, and that little chunk of space there start to pop up okay. and then the thumb is just a different variant of this although the thumb we can think about the thumb is this triangular shape 
having this big volume there. And then the thumb we can think about right, almost as kind of like a cylindrical chunk attached to that. So ball, cylindrical chunk. Right, and then kind of that little check mark over top of it. And then similar sort of overlapping pattern as I go off into the distance. Right? So while these things aren't particularly satisfying to begin with, again, they lead to something relatively quickly, but it requires us to think about them three-dimensionally more and more. So, Go ahead and screenshot that. It's a little bit of an expansion upon what we've just done with the hand. Um, and Ezra, I'm gonna ask you to take on, uh, let's say, let's call it a 10 minute pose. Okay. We're, still just, we're still just gonna do five minute poses afterwards, but I'll do a 10 minute demo that way it'll, I can flush some other things out. Okay. <clears throat> okay. So I'm just gonna blow up the upper section of the sketch, keeping in mind that, you know, I'd basically be doing the, this, this to the entirety of, the pose gesturally. Right now, just as the lower arm only relates to, or sorry, the hand is only going to be as good as the upper or the lower arm that it's connected to. Likewise, and similarly with the lower arm to the upper arm and the upper arm to the torso. So in the drawings that I'm asking for you from today, I don't want just a disembodied hands, right? Ideally what I'm looking for is, you know, and what you, and I'm looking for it because I want you to get in the habit of thinking this way is that drawing arms and hands and torso area, torsos as an extension of each other to be included with each other as opposed to something that is entirely separate. So in other words, we're not doing hand studies, like the hands that I'm doing examples of here aren't you know, detailed hand studies that would be accurate to the nth degree. They're more of something that will add polish to your drawings by giving something that's not only more complicated, right, but also significantly more expressive. And so it adds a, a huge element to your drawing to have, you know, convincing hands, feet, and head attached to it, as opposed to the stuff in between, which becomes comparatively easy to draw relatively quickly. Okay, so the initial gesture it remains exactly the same. And then starting to develop the structure of that thing, right, trying to solidify what the arm is attached to, or sorry, what the hand is attached to. 
and solidify the shapes of it as well. And then inside those basic shapes, starting to break down those shapes right into whatever more complicated pattern might physically exist. Now, again, the reason that we're not doing hand studies is because they're part of the drawing itself as opposed to something that we're concentrating on independently. And also we're not really ever blowing up the fingers, right, to being any larger than something like this, right? And this is already almost full page on newsprint. So in terms of say what's possible inside of a five, you know, if that's as far as I get with that, not introducing any sort of exterior lines, I'm just introducing something that feels a little bit more structurally accurate with respect to that. Okay, so even though it's an intuitive way of thinking about it, try to avoid outlining the hand. You can get a lot across just in terms of trying to capture the structure of the hand in terms of making that drawing feel a little bit more polished. Okay, but again, this and this go together. Now, zoom in here. Now over top of that, that's a different, that's a different matter. This is where I can start to now think about shift grips. This is having individual sides to it. And starting to block that finger out. It's so small. Yeah. So if I want to put in shadows, I've got a rough idea of where those structures are. And if I want to treat them just graphically, yeah. that's fine as well. Right. And then using that one there right, as a guideline for how to make this one here a little bit easier to draw because now I can place this knuckle with respect to that finger much more accurately. And then the remainder of that finger that drops down behind it a lot more accurately. And then similarly with the index finger. And behind. And using these rough volumes here, right, not as details in themselves, right, but an idea of say where that shadow right, might occur. Pointing towards the midsection. Of that volume. 
Okay, and then a similar process up here. Take a slightly different tack at it, right? To kind of underline right, what we've already done. Right? But here, this one becomes significantly simpler. And all I'm really looking to do is put in the overlap that exists. Okay, between the fingers there, right, and then put in a recognition that this finger here, right, has a side to it and is obviously in a distinctly different position. And then just drawing the little chunk of the ref, the rest of the knuckle that I can see in behind that space. Okay. So again, now in terms of scale, thanks, Ezra. That again is how big that drawing is, right? So, you know, the arm is about the entire, almost like the entire length of my hand. Okay? And the finger is like, or the hand is a cup or is almost a finger length in, long, or in size. And okay? so that makes that possible to do especially if you're drawing with a medium that's relatively loose. So if you're drawing with something that's relatively dull, right, or significantly softer, getting into any more detail becomes more and more difficult as either of those things increase or decrease. Okay, um, you guys have any questions before we get back into drawing? Mm -hmm. Okay, well, let's uh, get back into fives then. And uh, Ezra, let's, um, one easy hand, one difficult hand again. And uh, guys, for you, gesture, same way as usual, structure, the same way as usual, but then more specific details. Pick one arm, one hand first, and then um, if we're, whatever you have time left over for afterwards is gravy. Okay, so feeds and shares back up.